Good morning, everyone. And for everyone who's joining us on demand, welcome as well. Um, today we have an exciting webinar. We're going to be talking to David DeVere from Lights There in Portland. Um, David has come down to Earthwise and done our live coffee hours before. Um, so he is now going to be part of our webinar uh, series as well. And he has some really great ways to start talking about learning a little bit about LEDs um, and then kind of moving into how do we bring LEDs into our buildings at work, um, both on the inside and even the outside. And so what we thought we'd do is we kind of started um, with the five big questions I get asked a lot in Earthwise and David's going to go through them. And then thank you so much for folks that are, are going to watch us on demand who also had additional questions because at the end of this, if folks have questions, we will go through them and then we will make sure if you submitted a question to me, um, that will get answered as well. Um, at the end of our presentation, I will be throwing up um, our information on how to get in touch with David if you would like um, to ask more questions or you want to start talking about lighting for your business. And with that, good morning, David, and I'm going to turn it over to you. Good morning, Rachel. Uh, oh, where do I start? Let there be light. Um, <laughs> I'm David DeVere and uh, I'm with Lights There and we are a LED lighting company who specializes in retrofits. We're a trade ally of the Energy Trust of Oregon and a member of the Northwest Trade Ally Conference and a three-time winner of Outstanding Contribution to Industrial and Commercial Lighting for the Energy Trust of Oregon. I understand you have some questions. Yes, so I am going to start at the one I get a lot, which um, I honestly didn't know till you and I had talked. And what does it mean to be a trade ally? Trade ally? Uh, I'm going to start quickly with the Energy Trust. The Energy Trust was uh, created by a piece of legislation in 1999, came into existence a couple years later, and is uh, works with the utilities and BPA to build a sustainable energy future for Oregon. And in order to have uh, a sustainable future, you need to have contractors who actually do the contract work. The Energy Trust collects money from the utilities, 3% on your uh, electric bills, a little surcharge there. And they use that money to uh, incentivize uh, LED retrofits. But they're a, um, they're an administrative agency. They don't have any contracting capabilities of their own. So they formed a trade ally network that contractors can apply to be a member of. You have to first do five vetted retrofits. And to do a retrofit, you come into the building, you inventory and survey all the lights in the building. You, uh, we use a spreadsheet that propagates uh, LED replacements and you achieve certain energy efficiency standards using certain well vetted and accepted products. And if you do that five times, successfully the energy trust grants you trade ally uh, makes you a, a trade ally network member and we work with them on all of our projects the energy trust comes with us we first do the survey and then the energy trust comes back out when we do the confirmation survey and the energy trust comes out at the end to make sure that everything that we had planned to do was done the way we planned to do it. Uh, they oversee the project and uh, they uh, provide uh, the incentives. They pro actually the utilities provide the incentives, but the energy trust okays the process. 
Thanks, David. And I think that's one of the things that we talk a lot about in Earthwise, whether it's lighting, sewer, water, um, even having different recycling things come in, you always want to work with someone, um, like David said, that's vetted, that's trusted, that really knows exactly um, what they're doing. It's kind of like being in your own home and, you know, you just get somebody off Craigslist and you don't do your research and things fall apart, as opposed to, you know, looking at people who are contracted and really have been doing this a long time. So, um, it's really important, guys, to pay attention to that trade ally status um, when you're looking at any of your projects. And I think the next question, David, that's kind of like we all know about, we all know what an LED is, but what makes an LED different than a standard bulb? Why, what makes it different than, besides it doesn't have that weird flickering light um, on the overhead fluorescent, what makes an LED different? Oh my, um, well, it's solid state light lighting. Um, there's no, um, there's no f flame, there's no combustion, there's no, um, it's um, done using a small chip and that's manufactured that when energy passes through it, it emits a colored light. They blend the chips together to create all colors of light, you know, white. Um, it um, is very energy efficient. It, uh, LEDs burn um, a third of the energy that a regular incandescent fluorescent or an HID bulb does. Um, they're tunable. You can change the color. You can program them. Uh, they're they're digital. You can. It's it's a uh, a brand new lighting technology. You know, before we'd pass electricity through a gas and it would, you know, create fluorescence. Um, LEDs. Uh, have been around since 1965 as little indicator lights on remote controls. And they've slowly been, in, science has, physicists have worked with ways to construct the chips that allow them to produce lumens, visible light at a cost that is just not achievable using legacy lighting. They're, they're brighter, <laughs> they can be warmer, you can program them, you can do whatever you want with LEDs. You, if you can think it, you can do it. Does that answer the question? That does, thank you, David. Um, I guess kind of leading into that one, because you and I have talked about this a bit. Um, in Earthwise, if folks um, still have the overhead fluorescence. We make sure that they um, store them before they dispose of them or get them to a lighting place. Can you talk a little bit about the fact that LEDs um, don't have things like the mercury risk that a traditional light would have? Well, that's a really good point. It should have been made earlier. I mean, LEDs, um, are toxin free. They do not have mercury, which is uh, evident in you know fluorescent lamps uh, and also in uh, sodium lamps. Um, I'm think I'm having a uh, I find myself stumped here, Rachel. Help me out. Um, <laughs> Well, I know for um, Earthwise, kind of when you and I have talked, is the fact that um, if you break a traditional overhead fluorescent, there's a, really a protocol you have to do because of the mercury. Now, if you dropped your LED light, you wouldn't be worried about 
kind of the well, same thing. No, they wouldn't break either. Yeah. They're much more durable. They're, you know, they're plastic. So they don't have that, you know, extreme fragility that a fluorescent tube does. And yes, you're right. If you break a fluorescent tube, you have basically a hazmat situation. Uh, we have a lot of mercury in the environment. People are notorious for not disposing of them properly. Or, you know, and because there's a high awareness that they are a toxic element, I mean, folks tend to store them on site. They don't know quite what to do with them. They're hard to recycle. It costs money to recycle. Um, but LEDs don't have that. I mean, they, you know, I'd like to say, well, no, they're never going to contribute to the solid waste issue, but you know, they have a very, very, very long life, but they do burn out. And, you know, in the future, we're going to be looking at ways that we can properly, you know, recycle LED lamps. Um, it's not so much an issue right now, but it will be as we move into this new technology. But LEDs are very durable. They won't break and they won't release any toxins into the environment. Thanks, David. Um, and for everybody here in Earthwise, as you know, in Marion County, um, we are starting to talk more about um, materials management than we are recycling. And so when we talk about lighting, as David said, you're really thinking about kind of the life cycle of your product. And so with a traditional light, um, and some of us know this, you have boxes stored here and there on your site that we're trying, you're trying to figure out where to get your um, old uh, fluorescence to. And it is challenging and sometimes it's hard to get it there. Um, but when materials management, when you look at an item like an LED light and you can have it for longer periods of time, um, it is, less going continuously in the waste stream. And as all the technology gets better, um, you know, five years from now, 10 years from now, there might be a end of life program for LEDs. There's a lot that's changing in that market, which is exciting. And I think that's a really good segue, uh, Dave, for if someone did LED lights like 10 years ago um, at their site, the, the technology has changed. What, what would be better if people upgraded um, their lighting system, even if they had LED lights installed 10 years ago? Well, if they installed 10 years ago, those lights are reading what we call L70. And it's when the 70% of the bulb's life is left is when you'll start to notice the, uh, uh, the dimming aspects of it. Uh, from 100 to 70 percent, it's not perceivable. But after 10 years, LEDs have pretty much had uh, their good life, and they're ready to be replaced. I mean, they do—they're long-lived, but they're not eternal. And so, if you've had them for 10 years, and we're working with a um, a continuing care retirement center here in uh, Portland that was built 11 years ago to uh, lead standards and they have LEDs, but they're going to replace those LEDs. We, we, LEDs are more efficient now than they were 10 years ago. And in 10 years, a point that you made just earlier, they'll be even more efficient. I mean, people are uh, at the University of Texas in Austin are working on it right now to reduce energy consumption by another 50% using LEDs. It's really gonna be how low can you go in terms of you know, water juice with LEDs as technology takes, it's a wonderful thing and LEDs are a piece of technology that is going to continue to change. Incandescent bulbs, they haven't changed much since they were invented, nor fluorescence. But LEDs are a different animal altogether. So I would say, uh, you know, if you have your, your 10-year-old LED lights and 
you're kind of getting to that place. I wouldn't just run down to the Home Depot and get some replacement bulbs. This would be a really good time, I think, if you have um, LEDs in there and you're getting on that decade mark to maybe look at the new technology. Um, I have been really just impressed at the different, um, David, as you, I probably have the wrong word, so you can correct me, but you know, you can have very bright light, you can have very warm light. There's kind of a, a fit for every business. It doesn't have to just be that glaring light anymore. No, no, not at all. And in and, and fact, I mean, I mean, we are firmly into the era of tunable, dimmable, and color shifting LED lights with an app that you put on your phone. And five years ago, it was on the radar. People knew that you know the, the technology was there to make these lamps as malleable as they are, but it hadn't really gone mainstream. But now you can come in in the morning and you know, have the lights at a maybe a 3000 K uh, and brighten them up to 5000 around noon and through the afternoon, dim them back down. If you're in an office, if you're in a retail environment, you can create a very warm and welcoming environment. You can create an environment that really sharpens people's, you know, gets them up and perky. Um, it's, it's, it's called a uh, you know, human centric lighting. And it's because LEDs are spectrally, you know, in terms of their, their delivery of light, very similar to the sun. They're the same spectral distribution. And so it's light that we've, that we're a part, it's a part of our circadian rhythm cycle. And the LEDs entrain it, they nurture it. They don't disrupt it like a fluorescent lamp does. It ends up causing migraine headaches or you know, that constant flicker. And you know, most every, when you're under fluorescent, you normally can, you can kind of tell, particularly if it's a little old, if it's fluorescent light that's been in for a few years, it's flickering pretty bad. <laughs> so LEDs um, mimic sunlight. And sunlight is what we've evolved <laughs> around. Right. And, you know, I, I always, as I've kind of been learning about this too, David, is I've been really impressed. So um, for folks that don't know, um, our riverfront carousel down in Salem at the park, um, it's a beautiful carousel. They have hand carved horses. And it's just fun and it has all these lights and their bulbs are actually LED. And so this is a very antique looking carousel, but you would never <laughs> guess that there are LED bulbs in that. And I think, um, David, if you could talk, because I did have a few questions, so I'll kind of summarize them into one big lump. Um, if you're a restaurant or a boutique and you have an aesthetic, um, is there a way to give it um, that look as far as, I guess, the uh, what your lights would be encased in, you know, your light cases to, to make it still look like maybe it's vintage or antique, but you could put an LED light in there? Um, you know, Henry Ford is... One of his sayings, I believe, was, if you can think it, you can do it. And LEDs have gotten to that point. If you have a specific need, that light is going to be able to be created. Uh, it, and if you're a restaurant and you are emphasizing ambient lighting, it can be done with controls that will let you fine tune it. You can turn it up when you know the, the day is done and people have got to clean up and um, get ready for the next one. Um, if you're a retailer and you want people to feel really comfy when they come into the store, you can make that happen. You can have a section in the back where you 
want to draw people, you make it a little brighter. Um, if you're a warehouse and where production is important, you can, you know, we, you can have 5,000 K lights that keep the workers on their toes. It's just, again, we can create environments with LED lights that legacy lighting cannot. And we can save you money while doing it. I mean, that's one of the things that we really need to focus on with LEDs is their tremendous, tremendous, tremendous cost saving potentials. We've done, in nearly six years, we've done well over 300 retrofits and the average savings for people have been 47 to 70 percent of their lighting costs and typically there's when there's enough savings on lighting costs to pay for the retrofit you can have your cake and you can eat it too. You can have new lights. You can have an improved monthly operating income. And your, the, your, the bill for the lighting system will be paid for by the savings. For instance, you're spending $1,000 a month on lighting costs now. We reduce that by 65%. Now you're spending $350 a month and it costs you, you're saving 650 and it costs 500 for the lighting system on a monthly basis. You're $150 to the good. And then the, the financing options will expire in five years and there's your lease is paid off or the lighting is a service contract. These are options that are available, are paid off. And then the savings are all yours for the next five years. And then we'll come in and do it again because LEDs will have new levels of technology that will once more enhance your business. And so David, like we've been talking right now about kind of indoor lighting, um, but from a safety perspective, um, you can actually do LEDs in outdoor parking lot lighting too, correct? Oh, absolutely. Everybody, everybody, everybody should. I mean, this is the low hiding fruit of energy consumption. Um, the energy trust mission is to save kilowatt hours. Outdoor lights are almost always legacy lighting, though there's LED retrofits are in a, a new construction includes LEDs, but most of them are a thousand watt metal halide or 750 watt metal halide, low pressure, high pressure sodium, yellow, orange light, not very bright, not delivering all that many uh, lumens to the parking lot. Uh, shadows and dark spots and high, 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 high energy consumption on very antiquated legacy fixtures. And uh, in that situation, uh, with an LED retrofit, you can save 70% of your lighting costs. And you'll have a bright, crisp, clear, no shadows, well illuminated parking lot or the outside of buildings or loading decks or loading docks, any, any outdoor light. It, it, it's you know, what we need to embrace immediately, not only because it would be, it's good for our business and it would be good for participating businesses, the businesses who subscribe to switching, but it will do the world a whole heck of a lot of good we're in a real pickle. We're in a real genuine climate crisis. It's not make-believe. And I know that the members of Earthwise walk the walk and talk the talk and they understand this. The parking lot lights, my wish would be that we'd retrofit all of them in the next year. We will, everybody will save a lot of money and the earth will breathe a lot easier. Right. Um, 
And I had kind of had a question about the outdoor lights because um, I think sometimes when people hear retrofit, you hear really big, long processes. Um, but retrofitting outside is, if I'm, if I'm following it along, it's more about making sure that you have the time in the area available to do the retrofit, but it would not be a project that would take two years out of somebody's life to change their lamps around. Uh, are you asking about the length of time to do the project? Yeah. I, I think we, there's been a few misconceptions that to do a retrofit, it's a very long drawn out process. Oh, heavens no. No, it's, I mean, we, um, you know, the old time is money concept, but you know, for our, you know, for instance, if someone said, would you please come and take a look at our property for the purposes of an LED retrofit? We would show up and spend a few hours on the property, depending on size, and go through and very meticulously and methodically map out every light in the building. Well, we have SKUs, of course, and so we just are careful because the, the path that we set for the first will be the path that was used as we go through the building subsequent times. We make the assessment, we take our information back, we plug it into a spreadsheet, and that spreadsheet automatically will populate an LED replacement. Then we've entered the hours of operation into the spreadsheet and the end result is a LED replacement bulb for the existing legacy lamp. We have what was the original wattage, which we know when we're making our initial survey, we know what the wattage on the replacement lamp is. You'll have reduced wattage, which means reduce costs. And we present that information in terms of, we will express it largely in an ROI. Uh, you know, uh, and you can expect that you, your return on the investment on an LED project will, in a parking lot, it'd be less than two years. And, um, and then in a regular, in a, up to five years in a business, three is not uncommon. I mean, LEDs are so energy efficient, they pay for themselves quite quickly. And that's why it makes sense to do it. Right. And I'm going to actually have you talk a little bit about, because I couldn't even know where to start. Um, you at Lights there have a program, and I kind of call it renting the lights, and that's not... <laughs> It is, but it's not. And I know that that has happened in European countries and you guys have kind of taken that whole, how people can get started and do that. So I was wondering if you can, I mean, most people are comfortable with traditional financing, um, but this is a little different kind of program and I was hoping you could share it a little bit. Well, it's called Lighting as a Service. Um, and think of a copier, lots of copy machines are in offices and businesses on a service contract. And that's essentially what this is. So we, this is no money out of pocket to the owner of the property or the, there's just no money out of pocket. We come in, we do our survey, we do our assessment, we produce the document that I, mentioned earlier that uh, delineates the savings. And if the client chooses to go forward, we work with a, a, a equity partner, Essentium Capital, um, and they provide the money for the, the retrofit. The client will has the savings of our earlier example, we were saving $650 a month on a $1,000 lighting bill. 
And the lighting as a service contract will have a monthly fee of, for purposes of example, $500. So you're saving 650. You're $150 to, to the good on the bottom line. You've saved $650 off to your electric bill. You've reallocated the funds, $500 to pay for the service contract and $150 to put back into your business. And it's a model that works largely because of the high energy efficiency, the high, light, the high cost savings of LEDs and uh, there are equity partners who you know, recognize that people might be stymied by having to come up with $200,000 to do a lighting retrofit. But here they can have $150 to the month to the good. And then there is a energy trust incentive check that is also a part of the process. And which can vary. I mean, it, it will 10% of the project uh, might be a decent number. So if you had a $200,000 project, $20,000 uh, check to you from the energy trust when the project is completed. Uh, it's, it's all designed to make this make solid economic sense to the energy user to the business, whatever it may be. The energy trust and, and lights there and Essentium Capital, we wanna have this make sense for people because when it makes sense for them and they choose to proceed, our business grows. It really is a win-win-win situation. And lighting as a service is gonna be um, a model that is going to eventually become the standard in the industry. There's a good chance that LED will change at such a pace that in another 10 years, it will make sense. It will not make, it will make sense to go ahead and do it again. There'll be new information carrying capabilities of LEDs. There'll be network. They'll be able to talk to each other, basically. As a customer moves through uh, the store, the lights can shift and change, or someone in a warehouse, and as they move away from a corner, the lights will automatically dim, and they move back, they'll come back up. Um, they can track inventory, um, they, um, it's, it's smart lighting. You can program it. It's, it's just, it's like any other smart technology, it's malleable and you can make it do what it is that you wish for it to do. Thank you, David. And now I actually have, I like to call this section, um, let's see, I would call this section just, um, Well, it's for people um, who kind of just have maybe questions that are a little bit um, different or specific. So I'm going to throw them out there. Um, okay. You probably yeah. can't stump David very much because he is um, really, really knowledgeable about light and LED lights. So um, one of the questions I have is um, for a warehouse, um, are LEDs sensitive to extreme heat or cold? I'm, Rachel, I'm not sure her that we're a warehouse. Are, are, are LEDs sensitive? Are they susceptible to cold or heat? Does the cold or heat kind of mess with them? They have a very wide range of um, operating temperatures. Um, and if, again, this is early on in the LED 
revolution and, um, and we'll say since 2000 when they started to go mainstream there was more of an issue but technology whenever problems have been identified they've uh, the scientists have gone to work to try to uh, you know ex uh, celsius but they're typically um, um, not weather sensitive there, it's not going to be an issue uh, particularly if we plan for it from the start. But technology has created products that uh, have overcome some of the earlier uh, issues. Uh, where were we? We were answering a question about... Uh, temperatures and LED lights. Um, so thank you. And I, it's not, I don't think it's an issue. I, uh, we put LEDs and cold storage facilities, you know, you got to, again, LEDs, every lamp in America, every single lamp in America and in, in the world, for the most part, will be an LED in the next 10 years. And there will be no application, not one, that LEDs won't be able to resolve in a far more efficient and better illumination manner than legacy lighting. It's, it's just that simple. Right. Now, one of the things that we talked about is people can do, um, you know, like brighter lights or warmer lights, mood lighting. Um, I, one of the questions I had was if you had a building that was multi-purpose. So offices, meeting rooms, warehouse, um, each zone could kind of be custom fit to its own lighting need, correct? It's not a like one size fits all. Would you just give me the last part of that again one more time? You got a multi-use building. Mm -hmm. They wanted to know if um, the zones could be different. So if your offices could have different lighting and then the warehouse could have different lighting, that it's not a kind of standard set. No, it's, it's certainly not standard at all. And, and yes, the warehouse would have completely different lighting than the office or sitting areas or conference rooms or lunch rooms or hallways. Uh, we can even, you know, you can adapt them to individual needs. Uh, we go into buildings all the time and find people who have hung some sort of covering over their the light in their office because it's just too bright for them. And with LEDs, we can put a programmable, dimmable, tunable lamp in there, which means you can choose the color, the Calvin rating that you want, and you can choose to make it brighter or dimmer within that Kelvin rating. You can have an orange light, you can have a bright white light, you can have a bright white light that's dimmed down by 50% or, or a warm orange that is brightened up. It's all on an app that's on your phone that you can switch to switch, you know, you can switch it as your mood changes. Right. You can create your own environment in your office and warehouses well they're always a bright facility okay thank you um the other question i actually got several of these um kind kind of the same question um if people are renting from a landlord what is the best way for them to kind of maybe sell them into thinking about doing some work about converting to LEDs. Cause a lot of our folks are either in like multi, you, you know, multi office buildings or they're in strip malls where there's quite a few of the same businesses owned by a landlord. Um, what would be the best maybe opening conversation about retrofit to a landlord? It largely probably depends upon who's responsible for the electric bill. Um, if it's the landlord, then and you're you're paying a you know fixed fee and you're and you're 
least. Um, it, it could be, do they want to save any money? Um, it could be used as, um, you, you could approach them saying that you, you want to make your own business more efficient and uh, there's, you're thinking about converting to LEDs and that you know that they can save more money, deliver brighter light. Um, I would say get us involved. It, um, we have, it's, we run into that question quite a bit because it goes, it's, it's, you know, it's a standard operating model. And um, what we'll do is then talk with the landlord about the money that they're going to save by upgrading to energy efficient LEDs. It's uh, when people go out looking for a space now, they'll often want LEDs. Uh, landlords uh, know that it increases the value of their property, increases the value of their rentals when they switch to LEDs. It's, it always boils down pretty much to the fact that LEDs save money. Why would you not use them? For the landlord, we can do the same type if, they have, if they're a large property holder then they should use lighting as a service to um, retrofit all the properties so their tenants are happier. Um, no maintenance. Lighting as a service uh, means no maintenance for the life of the service contract. Um, landlords understand economics very well and I believe that we could show them in any situation that it would behoove them to retrofit their properties with LED lamps because they'll have happier tenants. They'll themselves will have an increased operating income. It's it really, why not do it? It only makes sense to switch. Right. And then I have one last question for you. And so this is kind of more around the construction industry. And so they were wondering um, about LEDs in things like if you go to a job site and you have a job trailer, can that be fitted with LEDs? Can things like um, their road lighting that they use at night, can those um, big lanterns or big lamps be retrofitted with LEDs for safety? Um, are there things that um, in the construction industry where they're sometimes a little more low uh, mobile, uh, the kind of the question is, are there ways to kind of retrofit their equipment, not a building? Well, absolutely. Uh, there are. And this is a uh, this is a new one. I can't say that we've uh, had any experience with this particular application, but I know that when large buildings go in and the construction firms bring in their, uh, their temporary office structures, uh, I mean, certainly uh, just, you can just add LED, take your fluorescent bulbs out and put LED lamps in. It may not be appropriate for the type of service that we provide, but construction people are going to certainly be well equipped to make those changes by just, you know, making sure that they get a lamp that is, has the DLC designer lightings consortium label and a UL label. There's tons of labels in, on lamps nowadays, but those two ones, D the Designer Lighting Consortium, DLC, and UL are the two critical ones. If they are there and you got an Energy Star sticker, you got a great lamp, and just plug it into your fixture. Uh, you can direct wire it by taking out the ballast, um, or you could buy what's called a plug and play and stick it in, um, in the lamp without having to uh, make any changes at all to the luminaire itself. Uh, in terms of temporary lighting, it's used quite a bit in uh, the construction industry now. Or photographers, you know, they'll bring out, 
but they're all portable LED lamps that are sturdy and can be set up on site and flipped on and you got 5,000K of brilliant lumens illuminating whatever it is that you're working on. Thank you, David. Um, and so for everybody who sent us questions, thank you so much. Um, right now on your screen, you guys see um, the lights there logo and David's email. And I would really encourage you um, if you have further questions about LEDs or how to maybe start looking at your needs for um, new or retrofit um, to go ahead and connect with David. Like he said, they do come out and they do do this assessments for folks, especially if it's something that you need to take to a planning team. Um, I think getting the breakdown of just exactly what you need. Um, Rachel? Is a great way. Rachel? Yes. Could I uh, take a quick moment to plug what I think is the most exciting thing that uh, Lights There has done in the last six years? Yes, please. Um, well, with, uh, we've talked a, a fair amount about LED lamps and uh, lights today. And, and just as you get comfortable, it starts to come to an end. But I want to quickly plug our COVID-19 eradicating lamp. LED, let me back up, ultraviolet light, which is light that is beyond violet. Violet's the last color that we can perceive. And it's, all, it's 400 nanometers down to 200 nanometers. It has well-known, well-documented uh, virus and bacterial fungi eliminating capabilities. It was in 1903 ultraviolet light, uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Friesen, uh, Dr. Lysen Friesen, I believe was his name, is, um, was able to eradicate, uh, cure lupus using LED light and won a prize for, uh, Nobel Prize in uh, medicine. Uh, that technology has been employed by hospitals. Um, the, the U.S. government used it to fight TB um, in uh, Philadelphia schools used it uh, to control measles and chicken pox in the 1930s and 40s. It's this piece of technology that we have that we just haven't really used. We haven't refined it to the point uh, that we are doing that now. And we have a lamp that is going to be able to be part of a retrofit process that um, it's in testing at the University of Missouri right now um, that will eliminate COVID-19 from the air. And uh, we think it's a, a game-changing technology and uh, are very excited about it and look forward to keeping everybody uh, informed about it. It's going to be um, a real positive thing for uh, the world. It really is. Well, we might have to have you come uh, share that when uh, it's gone out of its uh, phase and has kind of come onto the market, David. Well, it would be wonderful to do so. So again, folks, um, we have David's email up there on the screen, but um, if you have any additional questions, you can reach out to me if you need a connection or you want a connection email with David. We really enjoy you guys coming to these webinars. I know this is not our traditional coffee hour or our traditional lunch and learn, but we are glad that you guys are able to spend time with us or you're able to go back and get this information for you and your team. So until I talk to you or see you again, please be well.